chocolate. 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 From Dame Cacao, I'm Max Gandy, and this is Chocolate on the Road, the show where we explore hot topics surrounding cacao and chocolate cultures around the world. So let's hit the road. Hey, chocolate lovers. Welcome back to our wrap-up of season one. This is interview four of five. This week, looking back at my interview with Mackenzie Rivers, founder of Map Chocolate. We spoke back in April for the episode on home chocolate making. During the interview, we touched on Mackenzie's unique introduction to craft chocolate, approaching small batch chocolate as a business, and continuing to push her initial $50 investment forward. I'm Mackenzie Rivers. I'm the founder and chocolate maker at Map Chocolate. Do you have any chocolate or cacao pet peeves? Yes, I do. <laughs> kind of. I read recently um, someone was answering the question. Someone asked them, how do I know if it's good chocolate? And they said, you should try the award-winning chocolate. And the award-winning chocolate presumes that all chocolate makers entered their chocolate into the awards competitions. And there are actually a lot of chocolate makers who don't. A lot of the big chocolate makers who enter many, many, many bars into the award competitions. And so um, they spend a lot of money to do it. And so uh, for me, I don't have a problem with the award competitions. I think that they serve a great purpose. But I don't think that that necessarily means that it's the best tasting chocolate. And um, last year at one of my classes, we actually tasted some quote unquote award winning chocolate and um in a blind tasting and those weren't the bars that people thought tasted the best. I had a chocolate reviewer pundit send me a bar last year that won a world gold that she felt tasted terrible and it really did. So my pet peeve is I don't think that you can slap a sticker on your bar and and say that it's it's the best in the world or it tastes the best. I think there's a lot of chocolate in the world and a lot of chocolate that's really good. I mean, there's so many things, even like someone like Clay Gordon has spoken about that. You could have a bar that's sent in by a company or a maker to be judged, and it was freshly made, specifically made for the competition. And then when the consumer goes to buy that bar later, they see the sticker. That's an entirely different batch or it could be... Maybe what they sit in was, you know, made in a special way. I mean, there's just no way to know, you know. So um, that's, I think that's my pet peeve is if you're new to chocolate, new to craft chocolate anyway, or whatever you want to call it, it's not necessarily the bars with the stickers that are going to be your favorite chocolate, your idea of the best chocolate. Because we all have different palettes. But when you were first getting into craft chocolate, did you see some of those award stickers? Did that help you choose which bars you were interested in trying? No. In fact, I there were some bars that were probably wonderful, but they were in horrendous packaging. They probably had the award stickers, but I was new to it. I, I walked in the meadow and there's a giant wall of chocolate bars that I had never, I was already making chocolate. I had been online. I'd heard about craft chocolate. I'd seen some of the early chocolate makers. I knew there was a few names that I recognized when I walked in the meadow, their shop in Portland, and saw all the bars. There was a few names I recognized. There was a lot of really, really unattractive packaging. The sticker price was a shock. You know, I'm coming from, okay, there's candy bars at the grocery store. There's um, this leap to like, okay, bars that were eight, ten dollars. I think there were a few at the twelve dollar mark at that time, but most of them were like maybe six to ten dollars. But that was still And what year was this? Uh this was in twenty fourteen. Okay. And so I chose two bars because I recognized the maker's name and because I thought that the packaging was attractive. And I felt like I literally looked at that wall. I'm like, okay, they're all doing sort of the same thing, evidently. And and they have all these percentages and names. I have no idea what it means. Madagascar, 70%. You 
If you're new to craft chocolate, you have no idea what that means. I thought if I'm going to spend this much money, I really want, I want it to look nice. So that, that was my, my initial, you know, the, so the award stickers, the, and although both of the makers I chose were award-winning makers, these two bars, I don't remember there being any stickers on them. Yeah, it feels like a very typical story, though. You Maybe if you notice some award stickers, it might sway you one way or the other, but people tend to be swayed a lot more by the packaging, and these days, if they recognize any makers' names. So were you making chocolate before you were searching out a bunch of bars? Which Which one came first? Well, I was making chocolate before. I mean, I came into chocolate in a weird way. I wasn't online. I wasn't in a chat group. I wasn't, I don't, I don't know how other people start making chocolate. Ma you know, I really, nowadays, I think a lot of people, they see it in a store or, you know, they, they're online and they hear about it or they're on Instagram and they see it and they think, oh, I want to do that. But in 2014, I wasn't even on Instagram. And I don't think there was the community of craft chocolate on Instagram then that there is today. And um, I certainly couldn't walk in any store in my town and, and see it. And so, I mean, I found it, I found making chocolate through John at Chocolate Alchemy, who didn't tell me he had anything to do with chocolate when he invited me to come out and see what he was doing. <laughs> come out and see what I do. He didn't tell me it was, I, you know, I sell chocolate making equipment and cocoa beans. I thought he was in coffee. I thought he had something to do with coffee, which he does and did at the time. That's like the other side of John that nobody really talks about. He is involved in coffee. So it was a complete shock. And um, even when he said, you know, here, take this stuff home and make some chocolate, I still didn't really have a, a clue. I only had an inkling. I mean, I was, it was, it would be like if you never heard of, baking bread and somebody said, here, I'm going to give you this sourdough starter and these are the instructions and you're going to go home and do it. You'd be like, okay, but you really couldn't conceive of what it was. So I started making craft chocolate or bean to bar chocolate before I ever tasted any. I mean, the first bean to bar chocolate I ever tasted was my own and I'm sure it was really bad, <laughs> but I thought it was so exciting, so amazing that I, you know, wanted to keep doing it instantly. So then when I walked in the meadow, it was, um, well, it was months later. I mean, I started in March of 2014 and it wasn't till the fall that I went to Portland and actually, you know, I'd heard about the meadow and I went there to try craft chocolate and to buy some with $20. <laughs> were, were you expecting to see so many makers? Like, how did it feel to walk into that room full of just fine chocolate? Well, it was super exciting. And the Meadow, I don't know if you've ever been to any of their shops, but their way of doing it was so unlike, like if you, if you think about like a, a chocolate shop, like the classic chocolate shop, it's going to sell like lots of like truffles and bonbons. They have like a certain look to them. And then the Meadow is completely different. I mean, the Meadow has their whole wall of all the salts because Mark Bitterman, you know, is into the whole salt thing. And then beautiful flowers in the middle, and it's really warm and inviting. And this giant wall of craft chocolate, and it's very, um, it's very Portland and hip and fun. And so to walk in and just see all these chocolate bars, it was, it was so exciting and also mind opening. I didn't have any idea that it was like that, so it, it was exciting. That's like, I guess, like the nightmare of being a chocolate maker. Once it leaves our hands, you know, you think, okay, I'm, I like this. I taste good. I'm willing to put it out there. But it all comes back around. Everybody has a different palate. So yeah, I, that it's a, it's a good experience to have as a chocolate maker. It's humbling because you realize they would not have put that bar out there if they thought it tasted bad. I'll be the first to admit, I, cause I do so many inclusion bars and I have inclusion bars that. I really want to make, I have, I'll have an idea and concept, something I want to do. And I, they don't always hit the mark. Like there's no way they're going to always, every bar you make is going to always hit the mark for every person who tries it. 
And there have been some bars I've made that I thought, what was I thinking? Like, did that even translate? Um, it's fine, you know? Then that's one reason why I don't make just the same bars all the time. I just, I mean, I approach eating seasonally and really chocolate is the same thing for me. Certain times of the year, it's winter time, it's fall. I'm thinking ginger and cardamom and all these warming things. I mean, I don't really want a gingerbread bar in the summer. That's just not my <laughs> thing, right? I don't eat fresh strawberries, quote, fresh strawberries in November because they're coming from somewhere far away. You know, it's not the season, but in the spring, I want that. So I believe in that kind of seasonal eating approach. It's just how I, how I do it. So I, that's of course how I then approach making chocolate. I mean, you've become really quite well known on the Instagram community that you referred to earlier that's arrived around craft chocolate for your inclusion bars and your creativity with flavors. But that's really become sort of a signature of the MAP brand. But when did you decide that, okay, this is now MAP chocolate? Like I'm building from home chocolate making into this business and this brand that you've branded quite well. Was that sort of immediately after you went to the meadow, before you went to the meadow? Where on the timeline was MAP born? Well, it definitely wasn't when I went to the meadow. I mean, when I went to the meadow, I was, I was already making inclusion bars, but nobody was buying my bars. You know, I mean, you can scroll back through Instagram and like you have your initial post, like one, one person likes them. I mean, there's a few of the early people that you, you know, like, it's like they are finding the new makers. And so they like the post and that is so encouraging, right? You know, someone liked it, but, um, you know, I made bars way back then that nobody ever bought, nobody ever got to eat, that literally got, well, that my friends got to eat them, <clears throat> my family and friends, right? But nobody else, you know, how are they going to find you to buy it? But I wasn't thinking at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm going to be this inclusion maker. I, I was making the bars I wanted to make. I was making the bars that I thought sounded good and Number one, I was making the bars that I wasn't finding when I was looking at craft chocolate. A giant wall of 70% Madagascars can be exciting the first time you see it. But after that, it becomes like, what? I'm sure some people will look at that and go, well, it must be you need to make a bar at 70% and it should be Madagascar or whatever. But for, it didn't work like that in my head. It, in my head, I was like, well, I want to try something else. In 2015, I was at uh, Northwest Chocolate Fest. Lori at Dulcinea Chocolate, she's in Pennsylvania, had a booth set up and I knew her from Instagram and it was so exciting to meet her. And she, I tried her bar, it was Belize with candied orange and it was ma amazing. It was wonderful. I still rank it at my top 10 amazing chocolate experiences. And I, I loved it. So look, I mean, it's all these years later and I can still just call it. And, and that to me was like the permission of you can do it however you want to do it. Then I just kept, you know, I would have ideas of inclusion bars that I didn't do because I thought people would think this is too out there. But it wasn't really until I had the I had beans from Vietnam, tin yang, and they are so viscous, so thick. It's like you're trying to like temper the bars and it's you're like pouring fudge. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't know what I could do to make that any differently. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I've got, I bought a bag of these beans and this is going to be such a struggle every time. And so I, um, but I love the flavor so much. And um, I just, had that moment of thinking this the idea for the love shack bar came into my head i'm going to add candied lemon peel to it because tin yang is so bright and i thought it'll just be this great bright against bright and then i wanted to do something pink and i came up with pink shortbread so and that was one of those that was the moment probably that map chocolate became map chocolate it was me sitting at my desk, pulling my hair out, thinking, this is terrible, this is terrible, what am I going to do? And then at the same moment, thinking, I can do it however I want to do it. 
And I know I've said that in other interviews and I've written about it, but I, I think that's the, to me, the one message like in my classes, I want people to believe is like they can do their chocolate the way they want to do it. They can put themselves into it and their ideas and their past experiences. I think that's the moment when it became like, this is now map chocolate. When I realized I can do it however I want to do it. <laughs> I mean, I think that was definitely a big hole in the market a few years ago. And it's still a pretty decent sized hole in the market in terms of like having a lot of inventive inclusion bars. But how yeah. has that realization translated into maybe some kind of chocolate philosophy that you might have behind running that? Well, yes. And I'll say from the very beginning, though, from the first, you know, it was a hobby the one time that John loaned me a grinder and you know, we roasted the beans at Alchemy in the Beemor and winnowed them. And I took the nibs home and made chocolate that one time. That was the one and only time it was a hobby. And the very next day I said, I'm going to be a chocolate maker. And then from then on, it was always a business. I didn't have the money to to play around with it. There was no making chocolate for fun because it's a hobby and I have this extra money to buy beans and equipment. Um, it was, I'm taking money from my household grocery budget. <laughs> and so therefore it's going to have to be a business. And so really from the very next day, it, it was going to be map chocolate. My sister named it map, but I was like, I'm making, I'm going to be a chocolate maker. From the beginning, I was teaching myself how to make chocolate. I was giving it to friends to try. I was making tiny batches. I mean, I had the tiniest of the premier grinders, a little bitty one, which I still have to this day and still is an amazing little grinder, all the batches it's made. But um, I was trying to figure out what, how I would sell my chocolate. And so I started selling it on Etsy in the fall. I still have the same stamp, my first ever marketing purchase that I sweated over, which was, I think, like $25 for this custom stamp that looks like the world that says map chocolate in it. I'm still using that to hand stamp my invoices. And I, every time I do it, I think, oh my gosh, you know, that was a smart purchase. Here I am. I'm still using it. And I still love it, even though, you know, probably some branding expert would be like, get rid of that old stamp. I can't. <laughs> so, you know, and um, there are many, many things that I have would have liked to have done or would do. I mean, even going to the shows, you know, I would love to be able to do the shows, but it's a big expenditure to rent a booth and whatever. I mean, I'm a business person and I look at every penny where it goes, where it's coming in. I'm looking at my business analytics every day. I'm, I can tell you what months and weeks of the year and days of the week that chocolate sells the best for me. I think, you know, it is a business and I'm 100% dedicated to it. So, um, I mean, it feels like it's a, it's a responsibility. I've started it and I want to do it best. A few people said to me, they, they're surprised when they hear that sort of thing. Like in the classes, I'll talk a lot about business because they think I'm just sort of like, oh, willy nilly, let's, let's just do it this way and do it that way. And that is my creative approach to the, um, inclusions that is like that wild child side of me that's definitely there. But then I have this other side of me that's very focused on that. I want this to, to be a success and to work. I want map chocolate to exist in the world. You know, I don't want to make some foolish decisions and then it can't exist anymore, you know? So I have to, you know, I, I have to pay attention to every aspect of it. Not just the fun parts. I have to pay attention to the boring numbers parts, <laughs> yeah. which are not so boring, actually. It's kind of fun. Anyway. Well, it's interesting seeing the patterns and things. It's true of every business. Yeah, it really is. It is. And they're useful, you know. I mean, we have all these tools at our hands now that are so useful for having a business. So. Oh, for sure. I mean, are you still making all of the chocolate at home or are you out of the oh, home? Oh, no. Oh, no. I've been 
in my own kitchen. It's just a workshop kitchen, kitchen, and I have an office and then a bigger workspace where the classes are since um, 2016. I've outgrown it. I mean, it's definitely too small for, it's not too small for the chocolate making, um, but it's too small for having the classes. I'd like to have a little more room for the classes. And, um, and so I'm getting ready to, uh, this summer move into a little bit bigger space. I mean, it's still, it's not huge, but for me, it's going to be the perfect, the perfect place. And then I'm keeping my current kitchen and the, it has a big room like with a roll up door because when beans come in, you know, they're on pallets. You need to be able to have a forklift to roll them in. So it'll be for bean storage and for a roaster in the winter because they, they have their own needs. They're dusty and you know, that sort of thing. So I'll actually have two locations. My world takeover has begun. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that stamp is coming true. <laughs> So the first couple of years you were making chocolate only at home, like in your kitchen? Did you have a little corner where you were making chocolate? Yeah. So I had like a tiny, um, it was supposed to be like a breakfast nook off of the kitchen. And so with the kitchen and that was attached right to, well, open into it. And so that was like the tiny, tiny little craft chocolate nook. I had some, you know, big orders coming in and it was just just not enough space. So it was a happy day. It's always a happy day for makers. I think when they move out of that, making it in their kitchen or their laundry room or their garage or wherever they're all making it and move into a designated space. It's always good. Yeah. I was just going to say that it's a very messy process. All of the different steps of adding things. Oh God, don't even get me started winnowing. If you don't have a place where you can go outside. Yeah. Start and see, I've been, beans. I was always fortunate because so I started making chocolate in the you know, spring of 2014. And then I started working for John at Chocolate Alchemy in September of 2014. During that time, <clears throat> he helped me roast and, well, he pushed the buttons on the VMR. <laughs> he put it on a profile. It roasted it. I didn't do anything. And then winnowed. And then I would go out to Alchemy and roast and winnow. And I started working for him. So I've always had access. I mean, I've been spoiled. I've never used a silt. I've never used a blow dryer to winnow a day in my life. I've always used the ether. And so that's been, um, you know, I've definitely been spoiled that way. So I, ne I never had to have that sort of thing to deal with at home. I was lucky. You know, I, I didn't even have to keep my beans at home. I just kept them at John's. I bought my own. He has big barrels he keeps the beans in, you know, so he can fill orders easily. And I bought my own barrels to keep my beans in. So... I definitely was fortunate that way. And I mean, from, from watching John over the years and from your own experiences in your own home, you've definitely had a, a glimpse into the lives of many people who are making chocolate at home all over the I world. Know. Yeah, everybody. I mean, it's amazing. I can remember leaving a note in Yoon Kim's, a box of beans she was buying because I recognized her from Instagram and said like, Hello, like I've met lots of people because I put notes in their boxes of beans that I was literally <laughs> packing up and shipping to them. <laughs> Hello, or I'll draw That's things. So funny, yeah. Like um, Potomac Chocolate bought something recently, and I like drew like a fish on their invoice, <laughs> like because I know their packaging oh. has fish on it. They're probably thinking, who is this person? <laughs> you know that does these notes and crazy things, pictures on their invoices. But, um, yeah, so I, and I do, and I've seen, that's the other thing is there are so many makers. Instagram is a tiny, tiny window into how many people are out there making their own chocolate, a tiny window. And people think of it as it is the whole world of craft chocolate is who's on Instagram and what they're doing. It's a tiny window. And, um. And, you know, that's one thing that John said to me early on. Um, we were having a, a conversation and I was like, how, you know, how will people find me? Like, how will I'm making chocolate? How will people buy the bars? And he said, how many people are in the world? 
I was like, I don't know, like a lot. (laughs) And um, he's like, there are a lot of people in the world who haven't heard of you yet, but they're out there. And he was right. I mean, there are people all over. So um, there's that. And there's also, there's a lot of makers out there. A lot of makers. I mean, his business has, you know, he's had like last year was like a record breaking year. And then this year, I assume it's on the same trajectory because he's super busy. And those are all people. Majority of them are people making chocolate at home or on some small capacity. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Thousands out there at this point. Yeah. But now that you've been able to not just talk to other chocolate makers, but make chocolate at home yourself and then transition to being a professional, I don't know what that means anymore, but a professional chocolate maker with your your rented kitchen space or your purchased kitchen space, what are the extremes of home chocolate making? Like the really big benefits and the really big drawbacks of being only a home chocolate maker or only having the space in your home for making chocolate? Well, I mean, I think often it's the, it's trying to use a space for dual purposes. I mean, you're going to have to use your kitchen but then it is your kitchen, right? And so I think trying to keep everything separate um, and with, you know, space constrictions that happen because of that, having to, um, you know, pack things up, clean them up, move them away. Let's say you're trying to temper, you know, 40 bars. You've got to put them somewhere. You know, it's all that sort of thing. I mean, I think there are people who do it well and do it at home and they're super organized about it and that's really how you have to be and given whatever the cottage food laws are in your state you know we have all that that they have to um abide by but um i think i think the space is the biggest thing it's just it's harder to scale into bigger batches if you're at home, unless, you know, I mean, some people take like their basement and put in a kitchen down there and all that. And then, um, I think the other, like a drawback too, is it's like any job where you work out of home, you're home and it's easy to go, Oh, I need to do the laundry. I need to do this. I need to do that. And, um, it can be, your time can be pulled away from you even when you don't want it to be. So I think when you walk into a, a place that you're paying money to rent or to buy, let's say you own it, you buy a a workshop or something, um, then there's like this push, like you're there to work. You're there nine to five or five to five or whatever your hours are and um, to get the work done. And then you have all that extra room to get it, you know, to get everything done. And I think, I think it's just the size is probably the limiting thing at home. But then the flip side is you're home. You can work on things. You know, you can have your grinders running. You don't ever have to worry. Like, is everything fine? Because you're right there. You know what's happening with your chocolate all the time. That's probably uh, the biggest positive aspect of it. Um, And if you're, you know, and I'm talking about this from the standpoint of a business. If you're making chocolate at home, like I think everyone should make chocolate at home. Like if you like to make bread or bake or make your own ice cream, chocolate making should be added to to that because it's fun and it's easy. And if you have kids, they can do it. Your friends can do it. You can have parties around it. You can give people their Christmas gifts or whatever because you make chocolate. And so I think a lot of people are are starting to figure that out, you know, and the grinders especially like the premieres, they're not expensive and um, you can just have your own, you know, little chocolate making thing going. I'm proud that I've been able to take $50 and keep moving that $50 forward, right? My first purchase was $50 of beans and sugar and cocoa butter 
<laughs> and I've been able to push that $50 forward, push it forward, push it forward. And um, it's exciting when I see people whose names I recognize, people I've read about, people I've heard about, buy my chocolate. I see their orders come in and I think, holy cow, how did they find me? To this day, I'm like, how did that person, like, i am like, is that really who I think it is? I had one of those yesterday, like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe that. Like, that person just ordered chocolate from me. And I, that's like me pushing the $50 forward into making MAP become MAP chocolate. I still don't know how people find me, but they do. <laughs> Maybe I'm hoping, I'm hoping they find me because they talked to somebody and somebody said, I had this chocolate and I loved it and you should try it. I hope that's how they're finding me. I saw it I saw on Instagram. You're opening a physical retail shop. Yes. So, and that's what I was saying a bit earlier. So I'm moving into a bigger space and it will have, it's ma mainly for my classes. I was looking for a place that would be um, better for teaching classes. I'd like the students to have a little more room and um, I'd like to have more students. So, and this has a little bit of retail. And when I first was looking at the, the um, developer said, do you want retail? And I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not looking for retail. And then he took me to this space and I loved it. And then I have ever since I decided to do it, all I can think about are all the different ideas for retail. I'm so excited about, <laughs> I didn't really, and then it all made sense. Like, oh my gosh, of course I want retail. Like, and that's so exciting. Yeah. You know, the kitchen area is still going to be the map production area is not going to be some tremendous, you know, I'm not a factory. I'm not ever going to be a factory. I'm not interested in being a factory. I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize this. I am not a factory. Hashtag I'm not a factory. I mean, it cracks me up. People are like, come see us in our factory. And there's like one person that is not a factory. Okay. And <laughs> until you have automated processes and mechanized things, that's a factory. Like don't call yourself a factory. It doesn't lend legitimacy. And I think that, Maybe this is my second pet peeve of chocolate. It's okay to be small. It is absolutely 100% okay to be like, oh, it's just me and my chocolate's on my washing machine in my laundry room. Don't try to hide and pretend like you're a factory. I mean, we have factory chocolate. That's fine. But it's okay to be tiny because some of the world's most incredible chocolate makers, people whose chocolate I've tasted that for me is like unbelievable. They're not factories. They're just one person making chocolate. Or maybe they have, you know, their husband or boyfriend or wife or whoever helping them on the weekends. So it's okay to be small. I think that's I think that's the next wave of chocolate. There's gonna be some makers getting bigger and bigger and come see our giant new million dollar conch. And then there's other makers who are gonna be stepping into the spotlight that are tiny. I mean, I've never had any person who bought my chocolate said, I would really love this, except for the fact that you're such a, a small business, that you're so tiny. I would love this, except that you're not a factory. Like nobody has ever said that. So I'm like, lose the factory jargon, unless you are a factory and you have automated bar wrapping machines and all the factory equipment. Fine. That's fine. You can still make wonderful chocolate and make, have a wonderful business and do wonderful things for your community. It's just as small makers, you don't have to be a factory. But um, anyway, so mine's not going to be a factory. It'll have the kitchen and, you know, the workspace. And I'm really lucky. The School of Architecture at the University of Oregon, they have the interior architecture program. Um, they do, one of the classes has taken on Map Chocolate as their project. And each student is like designing what that space would look like, <clears throat> how it would work. and um. When I say designing, it's the it's designing with the approach that the client has no budget. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. So some of the designs are like are fabulous. Like I would love, well, I loved all of them, but I would love to implement some of the things that they're doing. And I might be able to do it in my way. So that's exciting. It's just, it's amazing to see Matt Chocolate through somebody else's eyes. And the students were given the notes that I put inside the bars. Each student got a different bars notes and then that was like what they use as their inspiration for their design yeah that that sounds like an amazing kind of collaboration not at all like yeah. any i've heard before 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's exciting. You you once mentioned that you actually wanted to be a pastry chef, the the chocolate maker well, for, a good, for a pastry kitchen. Yeah, that's that is like my dream. I would love to do that, and um, yeah, I would love to be the chocolate maker on the staff of you know of a restaurant kitchen, like making the chocolate that their pastry chefs use or, you know, their cooks use and working with, you know, you've got the chef talking to you about the menu and what chocolate would work best, you know, and what iterations. Like to me, I I would love that. I hope to be able to do it sometime. I'm waiting for them to find me. <laughs> I'm, wait I'm waiting for Tommy Crin. To come to me and say, come to San Francisco and be our chocolate maker. I think you're <laughs> you know, going to so. need to find a big pastry kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, and that is the truth. You know, often that, well, that's true, right? Often the pastry space is like the tiniest nook of the kitchen, like crammed into some corner. Uh, even though people have the fabulous meal and they're, paying like $500 a person. And then at the end of the meal, there's this incredible dessert. Well, the dessert is, it is the icing on the cake. You know, it's got to be this fabulous ending note to the whole experience. I'll say to myself, look, why then are they using factory made chocolate? Do they not realize that there's not just one thing that's chocolate? that it's a whole world of flavors, different origins. No, they don't know because they're not taught it in school, mostly. I mean, some of it now, but it's still taught like it's this big giant secret, you know? I mean, some chefs are starting to. And in fact, I have, I have a James Beard award-winning pastry chef taking a class of mine this year. And um, she's an executive chef for several different restaurants. So it is out there. Like they are starting to come to it and realize that it exists, which is great because I just think, you know, the world deserves better chocolate and more Absolutely. of it. Yes to both, better and more. So that's actually all of my questions. Uh, but is there anything else you'd like to share on the topic of home chocolate making? Just that I think don't, I think people shouldn't be afraid to try things that they want to try. You know, that there's no, um, the new rules of chocolate are that there are no rules, you know, and you don't, if, if 70% tastes too sweet to you, and I really hope that it does, then, although that said, I just made a 66% dark bar, which I personally love, but I'm like, you don't have to do it because that's what you see, <clears throat> excuse me, out there, or that's what you see everyone doing. Just because everyone's doing something doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. You know, it can be a starting point, but it doesn't have to be, you know, if that's um, <clears throat> Linnea, who owns Foxglove Chocolate in Portland. She's a good example. She's, I don't know, if she's been making chocolate for a full year, maybe about a year, but she instantly started making fabulous bars with inclusions, different types of bars. Like just, she makes dark bars, but she also just started playing with inclusions and working with them because that's where her heart is. So I think that's the key. It's like, don't make an inclusion bar because suddenly inclusion bars are hip or people want to buy them. Don't just say, I'm just, oh yeah, I'll make an inclusion bar. We'll throw this mint in here and call it an inclusion bar or throw nibs or whatever. Now we have our inclusion bar or some random ingredient because you're like, oh, I think it's got to be a weird ingredient. So we're going to throw like sardines in the bar or something. Like it's got to be thoughtful. It should be however, whatever type of chocolate you're making, it has to be thoughtful. And that means it has to be coming from your own feelings and how you want to approach something, you know? So I think you can have on one end of the spectrum, the ex, you know, the retired engineer who is meticulous and driven to collecting every bit of information, every roast, every minute of the melange and the conching and all of that. And that's, that's thoughtful. They're coming at making chocolate from the way they approach the world. And they're, they're putting that into their craft. 
on the other side, you could have someone who is completely just, you know, obsessed with different flavors and different combinations and trying different things. And I don't want to use milk powder. I'm going to use, you know, millet powder, whatever, some other thing. And they're, they're doing the same thing. It's thoughtful. It's, it's intentional. It's coming from within them and how they approach the world and then their, their chocolate. So I think as home chocolate makers, you need to find what excites me. What do I like to do? How do I like to spend my time? How do I want to approach my craft even at home? And then you put that into making chocolate. You can make tiny batches. I mean, John is the one who made that possible, right? Like you can buy a pound of beans or nibs from him. I wouldn't really recommend making a batch of chocolate from one pound. <laughs> you need a little bit more in the grinder than that, but you can still, you don't have to have a huge outlay of money to make chocolate at home and have fun with it. I mean, for, I think like teachers, what a great way to teach kids at school, whether they're from kindergarten on up through chocolate making. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of Chocolate on the Road. To learn more about McKinsey and Map Chocolate and the show, click the link in the description or visit my website at damecacao.com. That's D-A-M-E-C-A-C-A-O dot C-O-M. Enjoy your week and look out for another interview next Wednesday.